Eastern Standard Time, yes. Uh, English, absolutely. So. Still fiddling, Dave? I don't fiddle, I tweak. Oh, there's a difference? Oh, a big difference. You see, to fiddle implies a lack of direction, whereas I know exactly what I'm doing. And that is? Adjusting our home theater for the absolute best performance. You see, tonight's movie will come through with the sharpest picture and most awe-inspiring sound our neighbors have heard since, well, um, since our last movie night. Mm, yeah, that was great. Well, could you turn down the bass this time, Dr. Boomenstein? Sure. Now that we've got the sound and vision home theater tune-up, everything will be perfect. Mm. Except maybe your popcorn. <laughs> oh, hi, I'm Dave. And I'm Julia. And if you've gotten this far, you probably have a new DVD player or home theater system, and you're looking for advice on how to hook it up and maximize its performance. Well, you've come to the right place. Sound and Vision, the world's largest entertainment equipment magazine, has teamed up with Ovation Software, makers of the acclaimed Avia Guide to Home Theater DVD, to bring you this easy to follow setup disc. Sound and Vision has tapped its expert staff and matchless archives to provide the answers you'll need when you bring home your equipment. With Ovation's exclusive audio calibration signals and video test patterns, it's a combination that can't be beat. Now, in this home theater workshop, we've gathered all the elements of a modern digital home theater to show you step by step how to install and operate your gear. And we'll give you some basic test signals anyone can use to calibrate their TV and surround sound for peak performance. And if you run into trouble, Home Theater Tune-Up will help you troubleshoot the problem before you run back to the store to ask for help or return a component you think is broken. When we're all done, we'll show you ways to upgrade your system and offer tips for your next shopping trip. But before we begin, we've got a few notes of caution. First, some of the audio signals and test patterns on this disc could damage your equipment if used carelessly. Start with the volume low and then turn it up to achieve your typical setting. The video test signals are non-moving patterns that could permanently burn into your screen if left on for too long or if your contrast and brightness are turned too high. Set those controls to their midpoint before you start, then leave each pattern on the screen only as long as it takes to make the adjustment. Oh, and one more thing. We know how electrifying the home theater experience can be, but don't mess around inside your gear. Really, it could be a shocking experience, quite literally. All the calibrations on this DVD can be made with the external controls on your equipment, okay? So, let's get started. In this section, we'll explain the different components and their functions, starting with this, the DVD player. DVDs offer twice the clarity of VHS tapes and all the benefits of digital video. That means the picture is free from distortions like bleeding colors and video noise. DVDs also let you skip to any part on the disc without having to rewind or fast forward through the whole program. Just like a CD. And speaking of sound, DVDs use the Dolby Digital or DTS Digital Audio formats for six channels of surround sound. That's the same technology used to rock the house in most movie theaters. Put it all together, and you just might end up tossing out all your old VHS tapes. Of course, you don't really need a surround sound system to watch DVDs. All you need is a television with audio and video inputs. However, without a good sound system, you're only getting half the picture. The sound is really what makes a home theater. It's what brings the picture to life. For a home theater, you should have at least a 27-inch screen, though a bigger picture is always better. Home video displays come in several varieties, including typical direct view sets, rear projectors, and front projectors. We'll explain these options and talk about high-definition television, or HDTV, in the chapter about upgrading your home theater. And once you've got a DVD player and TV, you should add surround sound. The most common way to do this is with one of these, a digital, audio, video, or AV receiver. These all-in-one boxes combine everything you need. The first function of an AV receiver is to act as a switching center for all your source components. Everything connects to it. Then, when you select each source component, the correct picture and sound are routed to your TV and speakers. Now, besides playing traffic cop, an AV receiver decodes surround sound from your sources and lets you adjust volume and tone. The last thing a receiver does is power your speakers. You'll need at least five, including two at the front, a center speaker for dialogue, and a pair of surround speakers alongside or to the rear of your seating. Most people also add a sixth speaker, a self-powered subwoofer to enhance bass and special effects. Matching bookshelf systems like this one are called subwoofer satellite systems. 
They're very popular because the small satellites are easy to place and can produce excellent sound. The powered subwoofer fills in the base that the small speakers can't by virtue of their size. The five main speakers in a surround system should be sonically matched, so you should buy your entire speaker system from the same manufacturer or find speakers designed to match your existing ones. If you're in the market to buy a surround system, check out Chapter 7 about upgrading your home theater. If you've already got your gear, stick around, because in the next chapter, we'll show you how you hook it all together for the best picture and sound. You ready, Julia? Absolutely, Dave. All right, let's do it. Male, female, female. What is in there? Huh. Skip the owner's manual again, Dave. <sighs> so many different components, so many different wires and plugs and jacks. And... Bahama. I guess I got a little ahead of myself. Uh-huh. Hi again. We've tied Dave up here to make an important point. That I'm easily humiliated by stupid stunts? Well, no. We've done it to show how intimidating setting up a home theater system can be. We realize it seems complicated. There are so many different choices for audio and video connections and cables. Oh, uh, in this chapter, we're going to take you step by step through the installation process. We'll show you where to put the speakers, which connections to use for the best picture and sound. And guess what? You really don't have to end up tied up in knots. Just take your time and follow our instructions than those in your product manuals. Which are... OK. So let's get started. Yeah. Uh, Ju Julia, could you just oh, cramp? Cramp? Jul Julia! The first step when installing a home theater is deciding where to put the equipment. Your components, such as your DVD player, VCR, and receiver can be anywhere in the room. Given the power a home theater can draw, a dedicated three-pronged circuit is recommended. You'll need more than two outlets, so get a heavy-duty power strip with its own circuit breaker and surge protector. Stay away from table lamp extension cords. They can overheat and become a fire hazard. Any equipment rack with an open back or holes for passing cables should serve nicely. Receivers and power amps generate a lot of heat, so they need good ventilation, at least an inch of space on the top and sides. For traditional TVs, the distance from the screen to your eyes should be about three times the diagonal measurement of your screen. For a 32-inch set, your best viewing distance would be about 96 inches or eight feet away. Move closer and the scan lines making up the picture could become distracting. On the other hand, the new high-definition digital TVs allow you to get much closer, so consider that option if space is tight. In many home theaters, the sofa is against the back wall, which is fine, but for the best sound quality, position your sofa away from the walls. The open space behind you will help create a three-dimensional sound field. The positions of the TV and viewing seats pretty much dictate speaker placement. The front speakers go on either side of your TV. These are also your stereo speakers, so proper placement will ensure good sound for both movies and music. Make sure both your TV screen and your main listening position are centered between the speakers. Most home theater speakers are magnetically shielded to prevent interference with the picture tube, so you can put them right next to the TV. But they'll sound better if you spread them out to create a wider sound stage. Experiment to find the best placement. If you're using small speakers up front, put them on stands rather than in a bookshelf or entertainment center. This allows the sound to radiate without reflecting off the shelf or other nearby surfaces. In most systems, there are usually two possible spots for the center channel speaker, either directly above or directly below the screen. Remember, the center speaker's main job is to reproduce dialogue, so placing it anywhere else will sound unnatural. Placement of your surround speakers is critical. The sound from surround speakers should be difficult to pinpoint. That's why some are dipole designs, which radiate from two sides at once to create a wider sound field. Whether you've got dipoles or regular surrounds, place them to the sides of the listener and elevate them about three feet above ear level. Some people ignore this advice and put surrounds low into the rear, such as on an end table or a bookcase. Your home theater will still work, but it won't fully create the sonic envelope that makes surround sound so exciting. If you must put your surround speakers behind you, mount them high on the rear wall. Read your speaker and receiver manuals for additional advice. The last speaker in your home theater, the subwoofer, can be put almost anywhere. 
because the base frequencies are not directional. Corner placement is best, but under an end table or behind a sofa should work fine. Leave some space around the sub to let the sound fill the room. But be careful, there are a few things to know about subwoofer placement. Low frequency sound waves are quite long, therefore they are more affected by room boundaries such as walls and floors and ceilings than the sound from other speakers. That's why putting your sub near a corner away from large room openings will often boost the bass. As a second choice, pointing the sub along a sidewall will also boost the output. Pretty simple, right? Just drop your sub in a corner and you're ready to go. Well, not so fast. Since the sub often ends up in a different spot than the front speakers, its sound reaches your ears at a slightly different time. We call those sound waves out of phase, and they can make your subwoofer sound hollow and anemic. Another problem is that bass sound waves can bounce around the room, canceling each other out. You can fix these problems by moving the subwoofer or adjusting its phase control, usually located in the bottom or the back of the unit. We'll show you how to do that during the audio tune-up. There's another part of your home theater we haven't discussed. Your room. Right. First, the lights. Turn them down. All video displays work best in dimmed or dark rooms. Next, your furnishings. Mm -hmm. They're as much a part of your system as your components. Home theaters sound best when they're acoustically dead, meaning there's little reverberation and reflection of the sound. Bare walls and floors make rooms sound live and leave their own imprint on the sound. Rooms with drapes, plush furniture, and bookcases absorb the sound, which is what you want. Don't underestimate how much a rug, couch, and wall hangings can improve the sound of your system. Try this simple test. Just stand in the middle of your room, clap your hands loudly, and listen for the character and timing of the decay. Hercules. Try it in different rooms, and you'll see what we mean about live and dead acoustics. OK. I think we've got all the components set up. Yep. Let's start wiring. Oh, wiring, my favorite. Dave. I'm not turning around. Oh, Dave, you are such a... I'm Come not on. Turning... Ah, ah, ah. OK, OK, OK. So you're probably wondering what's up with the shirts. Well, when your stylist works for an AV magazine, this is his idea of fashion. We've turned ourselves into human test patterns to show you the importance of choosing the right connections when hooking up your system. DVD players deliver up to four different picture formats. Unfortunately, the most commonly used is the least desirable. Mm -hmm. Now, here's why. Take a close look at the pattern on our shirts. It's strictly black and white. But if you see colors in this pattern, it's technically called moire. That means you've plugged your DVD player into the composite video input on your TV. Composite video carries both the black and white and color parts of the picture on one wire. Now, when this signal gets to your TV, a circuit called a filter separates the color from the black and white. Problem is, no filter is perfect. So you get moray and other distortions. But there is an easy way to fix that. There is. The S-video and component video outputs on your DVD player carry the color and black and white on separate wires. Use one of these options, and you'll bypass the filter, eliminating distortion and improving clarity. It's a big jump in picture quality, and all you have to do is choose the right connection. Pretty cool, huh? Yeah, well, not as cool as these shirts. <laughs> a wardrobe! We'll be right back to explain more about video connections and help you hook up your DVD player and receiver. Dave! Not wearing it! Here's the back of a DVD player. We recommend you use the best and purest video signal you can. Now starting with the best, these are component video, S video, and composite video. Some players also offer progressive scan component video. It typically uses the regular component video outputs and hooks up to a progressive scan input found on some TVs. Now we'll say more about progressive scan video in our chapter about upgrading your home theater. I know, this sounds all very complicated, but just think of each successive level of video quality as removing additional layers of processing, resulting in a clearer picture with better color. If your player offers component video outputs and your TV has component inputs, make that your first choice. You can connect the signal directly to your TV or route it through your AV receiver. And we'll do it both ways. The process is the same whether you use the component video, S-video, or composite video jacks. Component video signals are carried on three separate RCA cables, often color-coded red, green, and blue. Matching color to color, run the cables from the DVD player's component video outputs 
to your TV's component video inputs. To watch the DVD player, switch your TV to the component video input using the button on the remote marked TV slash video. And you may also need to activate the component jacks on your players or the TV for the first time you watch. Read your owner's manual. If your receiver has jacks for component video, you can use it to switch among your sources. Locate the blocks of input jacks on your receiver's back panel, designated for the DVD player. Matching color to color, run cables from the DVD player's component video outputs to the component's inputs in the receiver. Then find the receiver's TV output, sometimes labeled TV monitor. Matching color to color, run cables from the receiver's component video outputs to the TV's component video inputs. When you select your DVD player on your receiver, its picture will appear on your TV while the sound comes through the speakers. If your TV lacks component video inputs, repeat the routine to connect your DVD player's S-Video or composite video output to your receiver or TV. Now with S-Video, you'll enjoy most of the picture quality of component video. Making S-Video connections is simple. The entire signal is carried on a single cable with multi-pin connectors. But please take care to align the little plastic tab inside. The pins bend easily. Our rule is look twice, push once, and keep S-Video cables as short as possible. The picture can deteriorate on long runs. Now the last type of video signal you'll encounter on your player is the composite signal we described earlier. It's carried on a conventional RCA cable and is identified by a yellow connector, and it's usually just labeled video out. Composite video from a DVD player is noticeably inferior to S-Video, but is still a dramatic improvement over VHS tape or traditional TV broadcast. Well, that completes the basic video connections. Let's move on to the audio. Now it's time to hook up the audio from your player. Here you've got two choices, analog or digital. The back of your DVD player has standard analog stereo outputs and one or more digital audio outputs. The stereo outputs accept RCA cables for a TV or an older receiver. Some DVD players are equipped with an onboard surround processor and have six analog outputs. These are for the six channel inputs found on digital ready receivers. Your digital receiver has built-in Dolby Digital and probably DTS surround sound processing. Use your DVD player's digital audio output to get the full capabilities of those formats. Your player and receiver may have jacks for coaxial audio cables, fiber optic cables, or both. Coaxial cables have RCA plugs that are often color-coded orange. Optical connections have a toslink connector on either end. Check your DVD player and receiver to see which connectors are available. If you have a choice, use the Toslink. It will eliminate interference that can occur with regular wires. When you're ready to make the connection, hook up your DVD player's digital audio output to the corresponding digital input on your receiver. With some receivers, the digital inputs aren't labeled for a particular source component. In this case, you'll need to assign a digital input to the DVD player from the receiver's setup menu. Follow your manual. Also, follow your owner's manual for advice on hooking up additional audio and video components, such as a VCR, hard disk video recorder, satellite TV system, or other devices. But you may still be left wondering what to do with this, your cable TV box. Well, in all likelihood, your cable signal is hooked up to your TV through your set's antenna input. Most people don't want to turn on their home theater just to watch the news. Leave your box where it is. If your cable box has audio and composite video outputs, connect them to one of your receiver's source inputs, turning your cable box into a video source component. You'll get better image quality and be able to use your receiver's surround and ambience modes for movies, concerts, and sporting events. Once your source components are hooked up to your receiver, you're ready for the speakers. We recommend you flag each cable about a foot from the receiver end with a piece of masking tape identifying the channel. If you disconnect your speakers for any reason, you'll be able to quickly reattach them. You'll also have to watch each speaker's polarity or phase. Remember, plus on the receiver goes to plus on the speaker, while minus goes to minus, red to red, black to black. 
Mix it up and your sound quality, specifically imaging and bass, will suffer. Bare speaker cables usually have identification on one of the two sides. The wires can be of different colored metals, the insulation may be color coded, or one side might be marked with writing or raised ribbing. The convention is that the red, copper, or ribbed side goes to the plus or red terminal on both the speaker and receiver, while the other wire connects to the minus or black terminals. When we do our audio tune-up in Chapter 5, we'll run tests to help you quickly determine if your speakers are correctly wired. Most receivers and speakers have connectors that accept bare speaker wires. Unless your cables are very thick, this works fine. But be sure you get a solid connection to each wire. Now it's time to hook up the powered subwoofer. Most have both a line level input and a set of speaker level inputs. The line level input takes the RCA subwoofer output from your receiver. The speaker level inputs are fed by the terminals for your main left and right front speakers. Those speakers get connected to the sub speaker outputs. The line level output is the preferred connection if it is available. Find the sub output jack on the receiver's back panel. Just use a long RCA cable to connect it to the sub input. Some receivers and subwoofers have stereo outputs and inputs. In that case, connect a pair of cables or use a Y adapter to feed both jacks. To complete the setup, we'll need to adjust the sub controls and set all the speaker levels. We'll do that in the audio tune-up in Chapter 5. For now, we still have to tell our digital receiver a few things about our speakers, their size and how far they are from the main listening position. Your receiver's speaker menu is visited once and not touched again until you change your speakers or placement, but it's one of the most important menus for achieving good sound. In this menu, you're defining each of the five main speakers as either small or large. This tells the receiver whether it should send low frequency information to the primary speakers, the subwoofer, or both. Now, for our purposes, small is defined as any speaker with a woofer that's eight inches or less in diameter the woofer being the largest cone in the speaker. The majority of home theater speakers today fall into the small category. Selecting small for the main speakers and setting the subwoofer to on tells the receiver to send the deep bass to the subwoofer, the speaker best equipped to handle it. You'll also need to adjust the time delay for the surround and center speakers. For the best surround sound, you want the sound from the different speakers to reach your ears at the same time. You ensure this by telling your receiver the distance from the surround and center speakers to your ears. Since surrounds are usually placed closer to you than the front speakers, the receiver adds a delay of a few milliseconds to the surround signal, allowing the sound from the front speakers to catch up. You set this with another on-screen menu. On most receivers, you'll be asked to enter the distance from each speaker to the main listening position, as we're demonstrating here. Now we're all hooked up. It's time to tune up our system. Hi. Despite Dave's sound effects, this is not a test of the emergency broadcast system or the sign-off of your favorite late-night TV station. Nope, it's just the Sound & Vision video tune-up, where we'll take you through some simple procedures for correctly setting the picture controls on your television. Now, there's a reason those color bars look so familiar. This is one of many standardized test patterns developed by the Society of Motion Picture and Television Engineers, otherwise known as SIMTI to guarantee consistent picture quality throughout the video chain from the broadcast studio all the way into your home. Home videos such as VHS tapes and DVDs are also mastered to these standards. So if you pop in a movie and want to see what the film's director intended, you've got to set your TV's brightness, contrast, color, and tint to SMPTE specs. Unfortunately, most new televisions are calibrated at the factory to look good in brightly lit stores, not in your home theater. But using the test patterns on our disk, you can optimize your television's performance, improving the picture and extending the life of your TV set. Before we get started, you should know the test patterns and procedures on this disk are designed to set picture controls on CRT, or cathode ray tube TV displays, including traditional direct view TVs and most rear projection televisions. Front projectors require additional adjustments for proper maintenance. Many of these are intended for only qualified technicians and installers. If you're trained to make these adjustments yourself, or if you're just interested in more fully assessing the image quality for any video display, 
The Avia Guide to Home Theater, also from Ovation Software, includes many informative test patterns. Now you'll need to do several things before performing these calibrations. First, let your TV warm up for about a half hour using any moving images, not a static test pattern which could burn into your screen and cause permanent damage. Next, go to your TV's on-screen menu and turn off any automatic color correction circuits, such as auto flesh tone or any others. If your set offers different picture modes, such as those labeled sports or movie, select the movie setting option. Otherwise, choose the normal setting. If your TV has different color temperature settings, you'll need to set that too. Color temperature establishes an overall hue for the picture even before you make color adjustments. Think of it as the color of the canvas before you start applying the paint. Consult your owner's manual to determine the setting closest to the neutral gray called for in the SMPD standard. Usually, this is the so-called warm setting. Also, if your DVD player has an option for something called enhanced black level, make sure it's turned off or set to the standard or normal picture mode. And you'll need to subdue the room lighting as you would for watching movies. Ambient light can wash out the screen and negatively affect the adjustments. We're ready to tune up our TV. For best results, it's important to follow the steps in order. First is setting the contrast, technically called white level. Now, if contrast is set too high, you'll shorten the life of your TV and exaggerate video noise. This is a demonstration version of the test pattern used for setting contrast. Don't make any adjustments yet. Just watch the tutorial. Now, keep an eye on the white box on top of the stack in the upper portion of the screen as we raise and lower the contrast. You'll notice when contrast is high, the edges of the white and lightest gray boxes become less sharp and start to bleed into the surrounding black area. This is called blooming. The best setting is found by adjusting the contrast to the point just before the blooming begins. OK, here comes the real test pattern. When you're finished, press the chapter button on your remote or wait for the program to advance.